back from the break. Okay, hope you enjoy your coffee and tea. Our next presentation is entitled Make Way for Storytelling to Build Essential Communication Skills. We are pleased to have Ms. Chrissy Burns and Ms. Tracy Chow from the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Ms. Burns is a teaching fellow at PolyU's English Language Center, where she teaches Storytelling for Life, a GE subject which promotes speaking fluency. She's editor-in-chief of Inscribe, a journal of undergraduate writing in Asia. Her interests include curriculum and materials development, experiential learning, and CLIL and genre pedagogies. Ms. Chow is a student at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University, majoring in English and applied linguistics. Her interests include cultural studies and sociolinguistics. Ms. Burns and Ms. Chow, please. Thank you. Share my screen here. Yes. All right. Thank you, and thanks everyone for being here. I'm Chrissy uh, here along with Tracy, and um, we're happy to be here from the PolyU. So, when thinking about skills that will help our students to flourish in an uncertain future, communication is crucial, isn't it? In indeed, PolyU's mission includes nurturing effective communicators. So we'll be sharing about a storytelling subject that aligns with that goal. And we're hoping to spark some ideas, some food for thought about the role of storytelling in tertiary education. So first I'll share about what I noticed in my classroom about communication. Um, and then we'll discuss the power of storytelling and the subject I developed, which aims to boost students' communication skills, speaking fluency and confidence. Um, and then Tracy, who was my student back in semester one of this year, will share a bit about her storytelling journey. So for me, I came to Hong Kong after teaching in Korea at a university there for five years. I noticed a big difference in the classroom. Um, there was a distinct lack of interaction, interaction uh, with and among the students. Um, I think, you know, we, we've all had these silent classrooms in the dead air. And I really started to wonder and think about the, you know, the reasons for that. And we, we know many of them, right? Uh, students entering tertiary education typically lack the experience and opportunity to speak spontaneously and communicate their ideas in English. They've been focused on passing the high stakes university entrance exam, which uh, no doubt has negative effects on their speaking proficiency, confidence, and their interest in, in English, to be quite frank. Um, but there's a bit of a paradox there. You know, students are tasked with making this sudden change. In the classroom, we encourage the use of English. In fact, our university policy mandates the use of English. Um, so there's a disconnect somehow between reality and expectation is what I've found. So a speaking presentation, you know, students can achieve this, but it's often, um, you know, aided by things by like reading from a PPT slide, uh, reading from a script or reciting something from memory. So they are certainly able to, to present effectively in one regard, but there's the aspect of authentic and spontaneous communication that that seems to be missing there. And I think that this lack, um, you know, really hinders their overall learning at use of university. It hinders their so social development. It's hard to make, make friends with your peers if you're not talking with them um, in class. And even their future job prospects can be diminished. So looking at communication through the lens of willingness to communicate helps shed some light on both the problem and the solution. So this phenomenon of willingness to communicate is the result of an interaction of complex psychological processes that prepare learners to choose their second language for authentic communication. Um, I guess over 30 factors can influence this behavior. So just briefly, um, down at layer six, we have the broadest influences such as social context and learner personality operating in the background. At layers four and five, factors such as perceived language competence, 
anxiety and motivation come into play. And lay, at layer three, the desire to communicate with a specific person um, appears and self-confidence. And this includes an, an aspect of emotional arousal, arousal, which is quite interesting. So these all influence the behavior of willingness to communicate. So recent research suggests that teachers can design classroom experiences that generate specific emotions and by prompting positive emotions can promote second language communication. We can see the value then of encouraging and supporting students' language use, creating a safe space in the classroom and building student cohesiveness and bonding. And I think the next part is important, you know, with communicative language instruction, the choice of topics and tasks, I think is also key, the literature tells us. Um, and the interaction that's generated from them. These all become positive influences on students' willingness to communicate. So with these in these ways, speaking can be encouraged, prompted, practiced, and from that fluency and confidence can develop, and finally the ability to communicate spontaneously. So let's move on to storytelling. It's a natural, universal, ubiquitous form of communication since the dawn of civilization. Storytellers have been instrumental in preserving and sharing cultural values, teaching life lessons, influencing others. A compelling story engages the listener, draws them in and communicates in a deeply powerful way. Of course, we do it every day from idle gossip, you know, sharing our stories with friends, sharing our stories on social media and the like. A storyteller uses their voice, body, and interactions with the audience to de deliver a powerful language message. So we can see it's more than language, isn't it? You don't need a high DSC English score or high IELTS English score to be a powerful storyteller, uh, to be a powerful communicator. Um, and of course, businesses understand this power. Steve Jobs and Jack Ma come to mind of examples of leaders who have specifically used the power of storytelling to connect with the audience and influence our feelings and attitudes towards their products and services. And universities have embraced storytelling. Um, that man there in the lower left is Marshall Gans, a professor at Harvard Business School who teaches a course on public narrative. He developed a storytelling model um, and he was hired by a young US Senator many years ago to train his grassroots supporters to connect with people, telling his story door to door. And um, so uh, leading to Obama, Barack Obama, become our, our 44th president. Um, it seems like a lifetime ago, it certainly is. So even in academia, there's, there's research going on in, in diverse fields, um, research involving for storytelling. Diverse fields such as business and marketing, travel, law, nursing, and of course, education, just to name a few. So I'll share now about a, a bit about the um, general education subject I developed. It's a humanities-based subject. The basic aims are for students to learn about storytelling, stories and storytelling, develop speaking skills, adapt their communication techniques to different situations, purposes, audiences, give feedback on stories and receive feedback, and communicate effectively about their experiences. In designing the course, um, I used the teaching and learning cycle and adapted the genre approach to writing instruction to storytelling. So setting the context, the context of storytelling is set in a quite with quite enjoyable activities, watching storytelling videos from YouTube and previous students. Over the course of the semester, we watched about 15, we watch about 15 storytelling videos. Um, we have explicit instruction of, of uh, the principles of storytelling and uh, effective stories. Um, so these are then used to deconstruct analyze and discuss the stories and videos, right? In the field of de deconstruction. Um, and then the story, the student story creation, and they're telling personal stories about their personal lives in this class. 
this is scaffolded in the joint construction phase, starting with you know shorter guided stories to longer and longer stories. It's aided by peer and teacher feedback. Experiential learning finally is applied and also the concept is taught to the students so they understand what's going on. So they tell stories, they reflect on their experience, reflect on the feedback they've gotten from others, think about how they can improve and then apply this to their next storytelling. This process happens over 13 weeks. Um, students tell stories each week. Uh, with a storytelling challenge. I'll share a little bit more about our um, curriculum and some of our topics and tasks. Um, starting, we start by looking at the universality of stories uh, through ancient myths and uh, cultural stories, such as the, the story of the zodiac animals. Um, looking at uh, concepts like archetypes and the hero's journey adds depth to students' appreciation and understanding of stories and its value in, um, in our culture and society. And then we teach several story structure models such as the classic story arc. We teach voice and delivery techniques. This is Amy Cuddy with the power pose. Um, we watch videos of storytelling masters such as Trevor Noah and even our own local legend Vivek Mabubani uh, is quite a storyteller. The students of course enjoy watching him. So we're, we learn about storytelling and we're inspired by these masters. As I mentioned, students share stories uh, every week uh, through a storytelling challenge of some sort and uh, adapt and uh, there are some activities which focus on different contexts, different situations. For example, you can, um, there's a mock job interview activity that, that's quite popular. Um, for the assessments, the students uh, tell their stories uh, first uh, live, um, face to face, or depending on the, the mode of instruction, um, is a live oral storytelling. Second one in a digital story, they can take a video of, them, of themselves telling a story or create a more traditional uh, digital story and a self evaluation that's part of the reflective aspect. And finally, students produce a reflective essay which documents their own learning progression. The last picture there is one of uh, the students from the first cohort who brought in the guitar. He thought it would be a great hook for his story and it certainly was. Uh, so now I'm gonna pass on uh, to Tracy who's going to share a little bit more about her experience in my class and her storytelling journey, Tracy. Hello, Rashawn. Um, so actually, when I first enrolled in this class, I thought I can like play with my creativity. I got to um, create a story that is fictional, that is imaginative. But then, um, when in in the first class, Chrissy told us that we need to tell our very own personal stories. So at that time, um, I thought like my first my first reaction is that my I thought my life it's very mundane and there's nothing to share so but I still need to like get over with this course um, so I decided to search up on the internet go to reddit um, combine a little bit story from this and that and so as my own uh, this is the strategy I used to make my story more engaging and the context more dramatic uh, in my uh, in the practice uh, for that Chrissy told us to do. Um, so I thought I can use this strategy as well in my assessment one, but then um, I thought I could get a good grade, but at the end, I didn't. Um, I kind of like the grade, it's not that satisfying, especially when you're an English major, you, you do have a standard for that, but I did not. Um, so at that time, I still don't know what my problem is. But then after that uh, assessment one that requires to share our own story, we get a lesson to consolidate what uh, we have done in the assessment one. So that lesson, we get to pair up with different classmates and share to each other about what we have teached on that assessment. Um, I got paired up with Ocean. Um, he shared his story about how he accept himself as a short person that he is above the average, his 
but he still learned to accept this identity. So at that time, he told me to like give him some feedback how I thought about his stories. I just sat there looking at his face and like cannot say anything because I was thinking all his words and thoughts and expressions it are so effortlessly intriguing. He didn't use any difficult word to embellish to make it stories or contents a dramatic one or just simple words so it was at that time i started to reflect on what happened to my approach to to in telling our stories um so actually after assessment one there's only a few weeks before assessment two come so it was the first time i really looked into the feedback and i i found out that what's my problem is uh, one is that I have been avoiding the most crucial part in storytelling, which is confronting with my past and my emotions. And secondly, the feedback is um, my delivery is a bit like an essay like. So, um, but because I failed, like, I'm not failed, but I, I didn't get a good grade in assessment one, so I decided to like, um, rearrange and think of another strategy to in my assessment too. And then um, I decided not to limit myself into one format it, or just recording my life as if I'm in a TED talk telling my story. I decided to have another new approach, which is writing a letter. I tell the story as if I'm writing a letter to myself. So this way, in this way, I can easily not in easy. I can comfortably share my own feelings, share my own stories, and that's how I get a like, in this assessment. Um, so actually, for me, after this course, I realized like storytelling requires like especially for the speakers. It's not just about telling the audience about who you are or what your story is about. It's about whether the speaker believes the story or not. So if you find yourself looking back at your past and each time you um, look at the memories, you have new takeaway from that, then it means it can be a story of your own. Um, by having to communicate with your past and present, there are the things that make who you are today and what you have become. So right now, I still think my life is quite ordinary, but this, by turning things into a story, is what makes my life more interesting. You, you mute yourself, Chrissy. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. I was really moved by the um, uh, reflective essay that she, she wrote in the class where she declared herself to be a more authentic communicator and reported her increase in, in confidence. Thank you so much, Tracy. Um, so I think we're ready for any questions that you all might have. We're happy to entertain them. Okay. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Burns and Ms. Chow. Okay, will there be any question for our presenters? You can leave the question in the chat box or just um, raise it. Um, can I start, please? I don't want to take all the time, but I do have a question. <laughs> yes, um, yes, please. To, for Chrissy and uh, Tracy. This morning on the way uh, to work, I was on um, uh, a social uh, platform and I came across this article about AI and storytelling. Then I decided to check out the stories that the AI produced, and I was truly uh, quite impressed. I mean, it's scary how engaging those stories were. So I wanted to get um, your view on the future of storytelling. Where are we moving with all this? I don't know. Have you thought about AI and storytelling? Have um, one of the people who was sharing about the experience in that chat was saying, but you know, this is what our students may be using these days to create these, story, uh, these stories and then submit them to us. So what does this whole AI storytelling 
what are the implications for us as uh, language teachers, but also in general, what is the future of storytelling? <laughs> wow. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Polly U has developed a new subject for the first year students. Every student will be taking some kind of course on AI. I don't know exactly what it is, but I can see Polly U already, you know, embracing that um, that new phenomenon. Um, I think a couple issues are raised. You know, first of all, it seems in our society everything is becoming data, and you can, um, you know, even going back, other scholars have looked at stories and found patterns, and um, you know, there, there are ways of different ways of storytelling that can be quantified. Um, there's also the the human element, which I I like to um, stress in our class because I feel like um it's it's more you know it's really kind of the natural aspect of storytelling and as students sit in a lecture with a hundred other students they they don't really get that personal interaction um so i find that interesting you know we do the last class of the semester is about modern storytelling where we kind of are peeking into the future and some of the things we have we have some of the activity students do are um posting reviews of their experiences in restaurants on you know online so um they're using you know social media as a way to express themselves and their stories and um we talk about how you know the, the your story becomes your identity your brand of course in in, in the workplace um so that's a huge question svetlana i'm not quite sure uh but the far future holds but it's certainly um, an interesting and, and, and relevant one for students and, and all of us. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry for raising that question in a way, but I, I know there is no quite an answer yet. Uh, but it's just something that I would like to personally continue thinking about, I think, and keeping an eye on and see how that could be um, integrated into our teaching, because obviously it's there to stay. Um, and AI storytelling is likely to become part of our lives as well. So very keen to explore and see where we're going to be moving uh, with this. Thank you, Chrissy, so much, uh, and Tracy, for your really engaging um, story about storytelling. Thank you. I don't know if there are other questions, but I'll pass this back to Piers now. Thanks. Can I ask a, a question of Tracy? Tracy sure. is actually a, a student of mine who took in semester two uh, a course on screenwriting. So Tracy, what's uh, what kind of learning interaction did you experience between taking uh, Chrissy's storytelling course in SEM 1 and uh, the screenwriting course in screen two in semester two? <laughs> um, I guess was there was there any connection? Did you see connections between the different courses? I think there's two connections. One is about, because in Chrissy lesson, we get a lot of chance to talk to our classmates. We get to pair, mix and match a lot of time. So um, I guess it's about able to sharing your story, like even any story to others. Because sometimes when you have a story, you just want to keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. So like this, like from, the semester one course to your course, I like become more comfortable in telling others what is happening in my story. And the second thing will be, it's about integrating my own personal life into a uh, into my screenplay. So sometimes it's just you know it can be totally imaginative, but at some element, at some points, it's actually my deepest emotion. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, there's a stereotype about uh, everyone's first screenplay is autobiographical. You know, I don't know to what extent that's true of you, but <laughs> great, thanks. <laughs>